Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. Tonight, new numbers show where race and COVID-19 collide. It allows for us to say this is not anecdotal, this is real. Activists want the data, but Quebec hasn't collected it. I'm Andrew Chang. Also tonight, BC's brutal spike in overdose deaths. I cannot express how difficult this news has been to hear. How the pandemic plays a part. At this stage, do you think a second wave is inevitable? Rosie gets the goods from Dr. Anthony Fauci. And reflections from a former hockey player. I absolutely believe this is that moment in time for change. Nearly half a century after a defining moment. This is The National. For weeks, Canadians have been gripped by two huge concerns, COVID-19 and race. We are beginning tonight where the two meet in Montreal. We've reported for quite some time now that parts of the city's large black population have taken the brunt of the disease. Well, tonight, we have numbers to back it up. Now, we tried getting race-based data from health authorities, but there isn't any. So CBC News took it on. We compared the areas of confirmed COVID cases with details about who lives there. Alison Northcott takes us through the picture that emerged. It is not one-dimensional at all. Tiffany Callender says she knew her neighborhood would be vulnerable to COVID-19 even before the outbreak took hold. There are clear disparities in terms of health, housing, economics. So when, the, when you hear the impact of COVID come into play, you know that that's going to multiply those things by 10. That connection has been observed for weeks, but now CBC News has used census data to pinpoint it. This is a map of COVID-19 cases in Montreal. Our analysis found correlations between hard-hit areas and factors such as race, income and housing. The strongest between the number of cases per 100,000 residents and the percentage of black residents. It allows for us to say this is not anecdotal, this is real. There were also correlations with the number of health care workers and low-income earners. The data doesn't determine why. We raised the red flag since, since the get-go. This activist says Montreal North is home to many frontline workers and cramped apartments and says the government didn't act fast enough. The fact that black, the black population is contracting the virus doesn't mean that you know, they are more prone to be uh, infected by any virus. They're just more prone to inequalities. Last month, the government said it would collect race-based data, but hasn't started yet. I think that the issue of collecting information about race is always a sensitive one. I think there's going to be probably some studies done specifically on those populations. This is Epidemiology 101, to understand which populations and which individuals are more likely to become infected or less likely to become infected. We are the experts and understanding how COVID-19 would affect the black community. Calendar says race-based data and consultations with community groups will allow the province to tailor its response and better prepare for a possible second wave. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Turning to BC now and more proof that COVID-19 intersects with already marginalized people in so many ways. A record number of overdose deaths last month, more during May than the province has seen from COVID-19 in total. Friar Stewart looks at two public health crises, one making the other worse. Right there, 120 bucks. This is what $120 of fentanyl looks like on the streets. Danny Ross sells it and says it isn't hard for him to get his hands on drugs these days. Is it the police? Uh... But when it comes to using, he has one rule. And I never use alone. If you use alone, you're fucking dead. You're gone. For years, thousands in BC have been dying from toxic fentanyl. But now, in the middle of a global pandemic, it's getting worse. The number of deadly overdoses started rising substantially in March. Then last month, a dismal record, 170 deaths. A more than 90% increase from May of last year. I cannot express how difficult this news has been to hear. Health officials say the drugs have become even more toxic. Border closures have disrupted the supply, so the drugs on the street are being cut differently. It's a sad state of affairs right now. You know, we have people dying every day. And people are turning to new sources to find drugs. Before, uh, I would buy from three different people, and that was it. Now, that's, that, that's, it's hard to do. Another issue, safety protocols to help stop the spread of COVID-19 has meant many safe consumption sites can only run at half capacity 
and there are fewer places to test drugs. A lot of the SROs or single room occupancies aren't allowing visitors in and people are using alone and they're dying, right? Are you all right, man? Trey Helton says the one good thing to come out of the pandemic is that the province expanded access to safe supply so synthetic opioids can be prescribed to more people. But right now, most are still turning to the street and what they're finding is even deadlier than before. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. Today, six provinces reported new cases of COVID-19. Quebec is, is continuing on its downward trend, adding just 144 new cases. Ontario had the most new confirmed cases, 203. Alberta added 40, British Columbia 14. Canada's total confirmed cases tonight, more than 97,000. Ontario daycares are allowed to reopen tomorrow, but the question is how many of them will? The new procedures to prevent the spread of this coronavirus will take time and money to implement. And as Deanna Sumanak-Johnson tells us, it is not clear who's paying for it. After months of caring for them at home, you'd think Patrick Wong would jump at the chance to send his kids back to daycare. Instead, he was struck by the short notice Ontario child care centres were given to implement extensive safety procedures. With what funding? With what strategy? It doesn't seem to me like we have a uniform practice of engaging safely. In fact, many daycares in Ontario will not open tomorrow. The reason? Too many changes to be made, too little time and money, says this operator of a child care centre. The trickiest to implement? Group sizes that can't exceed 10. That's with the teachers. I mean, out of my 24 preschooler children, how do I decide which eight get the coveted spaces? Other rules and recommendations outlined in the government document sent to daycares? Frequent sanitization of toys, removal of soft toys that can't be cleaned, and temperature checks for each child that drop off. That's one additional staffing person that cannot work in the rooms and that has to staff the screening entrance in full PPE. Which leads to the question of who will pay for all those changes. The government told child care centers they can't charge more, but the center Patrick Wong's children attend sent parents a letter warning the fees might triple or quadruple. We can't afford that. I don't know anyone who could. Ontario Ministry of Education said in a statement, by imposing specific public health requirements, we are signaling our firm commitment to keeping our children, staff and our families safe. For families like Patrick Wong's, the choice right now is to keep the kids at home, even if it means he can't go looking for a job just yet. Deanna Sumanak-Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Now, Toronto is planning to make face coverings mandatory on its public transit system, possibly as early as July 2nd. If approved, there would technically be a fine for breaking the law, but the early emphasis would be on education, not enforcement. There would also be exemptions, children under two and anybody who can't wear a mask for medical reasons. In Atlantic Canada, the COVID-19 numbers are low, and that has led to talk of an Atlantic bubble. As Kayla Hounsell tells us, it would allow people to travel within the four provinces without having to self-isolate. This is Peggy's Cove today, not a soul in sight. This is the major tourist attraction on pretty much any day before COVID-19. We've had a huge economic loss. John Campbell's restaurant is open now, but not many are coming. He says an Atlantic bubble will help. It will help tremendously because we have nothing. The Atlantic provinces continue to restrict access to varying degrees. The regional bubble would allow residents to move freely without isolating. That would be exactly what we need, I think, right now. This Dalhousie University professor specializes in tourism management. The economic fear is, is now well outweighing the fear of, of the health risk. Sheehan says typically about 50% of the people who visit Nova Scotia and places like Peggy's Cove come from elsewhere in Canada and around the world. The other half are already coming from within the region, but he says now is the time for the Atlantic provinces to start marketing themselves to one another. But so far, the Atlantic premiers are not all committing to the idea. You know what's an interesting discussion? You know, something that, you know, we can look at, but now is not the time for us. We agreed over the next um, few weeks to, to have our authorities work together. Campbell has already started purchasing local ads. I think 
for me, if I ever came close to probably 50% of normal revenue, I'd, I, I'd, I'd top any goal I had. So we're not going to get there, but, but it may keep, it will keep people employed. Fish and chips. His message to other Atlantic Canadians is that what is perhaps the most photographed lighthouse in the world is worth crossing a provincial border. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Peggy's Cove, Nova Scotia. Now in the U.S., the situation is much more dire. COVID cases are spiking there, mere weeks after reopening started. And there are hard projections of what price in human life that may carry. Here's Susan Ormiston. COVID caution severely tested when protests swept America, gaining in size and strength. Many cities immediately urging demonstrators, get tested. One more worry about coronavirus spread. Not at the White House. We may have some embers or some ashes. Trump continuing to smother concerns. We'll stomp them out. Today, more like flames than embers, the U.S. stock market's worst fall since mid-March. I think the question is, you know, did we reopen too soon, you know, is a valid one. COVID hospitalizations at a record high in Arizona, U.S. cases toppling 2 million, rising in 21 states, even after Vice President Mike Pence said, don't worry. We don't see an increase uh, in new cases now, nearly two weeks on from when the first protests took effect. It's too early to tell conclusively, say health experts. Projections show spikes now will result in tens of thousands more deaths. We're seeing right now about 180,000 deaths, total deaths, until the end of September. The U.S. recovery, more of a shallow downward slope than a flattening curve. In Canada, a more demonstrable decline. The U.K. marching clearly down, while Italy's shape, what everyone seeks. Their, uh, Dr. Mokded says the U.S. and Canada are going in the right direction, but beware the autumn. There is a decline all the way till the third week of August and it start going up after that. And it will start going up even rapidly the second week or third week of uh, September. So just as worries resurface about this virus and reopening, President Trump announces he'll go back on the road for large campaign rallies beginning in a week. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Washington. Now, one of the most recognized faces of the U.S. fight against COVID-19 is Dr. Anthony Fauci. Earlier today, he spoke to Rosemary Barton. Do you think a second wave is inevitable? We know the most pandemics do have one. It is not inevitable that we will have a second wave, as it were. But it could happen if we don't handle the cases that will inevitably appear. You'll hear more of Fauci's message in his first Canadian television interview coming up. Systemic racism is an issue right across the country in all our institutions, including in all our police forces, including in the RCMP. That's what systemic racism is. The Prime Minister today bluntly stating that systemic racism exists in the RCMP. On the National last night, Commissioner Brenda Lucky said it depended on how it's defined. Well, today Trudeau insisted he has faith in the work Lucky is doing to combat racism in the force. Now, one recent incident that is under scrutiny is the arrest of Alberta First Nation Chief Alan Adam. Tonight, CBC News has obtained dash camera footage of that arrest. Rafi Bujikanian takes us through. Until today, this was the only publicly available video showing the events in March. Earlier this week, Fort Chippewan First Nation Chief Alan Adams said he and his wife were stopped after leaving a casino because of expired license plates. Then, things escalated. No way in any circumstances should an RCMP put his hands on you, let alone uh, give you a clothesline and uh, do excessive damage to one person's face. Tonight, his lawyers have submitted the police dash cam video, which gives a much clearer picture of what happened. Now, Chief Adams' lawyer wants to use that video to have assault charges dismissed. He, as the leader, feels that he has to stand up and make the statement. You can't, if you're bothering me as the leader, what's happening to those people who have no voice? 
Adam is due in court in July. Alberta's external police investigation body, ACERT, says it's also investigating the conduct of the officers. Rafi Bujikani, CBC News, Edmonton. The Trudeau government has always declared its commitment to core values of diversity and equity. But what has that meant for the makeup of the federal civil service? Salima Shibji looks at who gets hired and who gets promoted. Thank you for being here. A dramatic show of support from a prime minister big on symbols. Because it's 2015. When Justin Trudeau first unveiled a gender-balanced cabinet, he also promised his government would reflect the country. Uh, a cabinet that looks like Canada. But there still isn't much color behind the scenes. Of 37 chiefs of staff, just four are visible minorities, 11 percent. Less than half their actual presence in the population. Omar Aziz worked briefly as an advisor in Christia Freeland's office. I would go into meetings and I'm the only non-white person there. I felt that when I would raise my voice and give my advice that it wasn't taken seriously. The Liberals have doubled the number of minorities named to run agencies, boards and crown corporations. But they lag when it comes to deputy ministers, the senior most level. And we use a risk Caroline Xavier became the first black civil servant ever to become an associate deputy minister in February. How come it took so long? It shouldn't have. The conversations are happening. There's a recognition at the most senior levels that this has got to get rectified. One conversation that isn't easy, that black employees are often at the bottom of the salary scale. We keep having committees and reports and to be honest, we're coming up with the same data we have to eliminate these barriers. Barriers like language requirements and the need for regional representation. Also, employment equity laws use the broad term visible minority, assuming the reality is the same for a black Canadian as for a South Asian. It's not. That language may change, but five years after that photo op, revamping the public service has even more urgency for the prime minister. This is a moment where Canadians are recognizing that there is unfairness built into our system with protesters ready to hold him to his promises. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ottawa. Thank you. The Canadian Museum for Human Rights is one of those crown corporations. And as Cameron McIntosh shows us, it is facing allegations of racial discrimination. Symbolic as a backdrop, the Canadian Museum for Human Rights was the endpoint of a march that drew thousands in support of Black Lives Matter. Now, some are calling out the museum itself for its treatment of staff who are black Indigenous and people of color. I am the only black as a volunteer. All I've left. Justin Onduasumu has volunteered there since day one. He says racism was a factor when he was passed over for a paying job three times. I'm an accountant. I applied for accounting. No way. Online, several former staff are posting similar complaints about being marginalized as management looked the other way. I experienced racism at the museum, either from staff, from visitors, uh, or from stakeholders. This former guide started the thread. It's about repeatedly um, trying to address the issue and kind of repeatedly getting the brush off or uh, no results or no change. The museum has faced previous accusations of a toxic work environment. It's clear that there's some shortcomings here in the institution. CEO John Young says there will be external reviews of how staff are treated. We have a plan to engage with our staff first and foremost. We have to build trust internally and then seek to build trust externally. The structures of the museum have had ample time to hear from Black, Indigenous and people of colour staff and have ample evidence already. Asumu welcomes the dialogue. I want the people to say that uh, we can change. The museum promises a transparent review. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. Facial recognition software is popular with law enforcement, but this week, three major companies said police forces have to stop using it. Thomas Degg shows us why. Maybe you've used facial recognition at the airport or to unlock your smartphone, but when the technology is used by police to identify suspects, that's when it causes the most concern. Calgary police were the first in Canada to show off their facial recognition software more than five years ago. But it's grown more sophisticated, with British authorities now using live cameras and artificial intelligence to spot suspects. We're able to track a person even if they're not in the shot. 
Amazon has been boasting for years about its software's capabilities, but now a shift. Amid growing scrutiny, Amazon, IBM, and Microsoft all announced this week they're at least pausing police use of their facial recognition tools in the U.S. Until we have a national law in place grounded in human rights that will govern this technology. The software scans faces, measuring key features and storing the data. But the data it's given to learn mostly comes from white faces, meaning people of color can be misidentified. And it creates what's called a face graph, which is a statistical model of a face. When it comes to black faces, a, a face like mine, I would completely confuse the system. In Ontario, the Privacy Commissioner learned of 15 police agencies that temporarily used facial recognition. If police actually cared about this as a concern, they would, not, they would say they're not going to use this technology. Just one of the many demands as police tactics are put in the spotlight and calls for defunding grow louder. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. Donald Trump's top general says he regrets doing a photo shoot with the president. I should not have been there. Up next, why he's joining a growing list of military leaders at odds with the White House. Plus, in depth with Dr. Anthony Fauci. What is the message to, to the world uh, about how the United States is doing? How concerned should the world be? The U.S.'s top infectious diseases expert in his first Canadian TV interview. And after three months, the sweetest reunion. <laughs> Nothing beats a hug from mom. We're back in two. Christopher Columbus in Texas and Florida daubed with blood red paint. In Boston, beheaded. A Confederate monument hooded and marked in Georgia. Another pulled apart in Virginia. Across the United States, people aren't waiting for politicians to make the decision. They are tearing down symbols associated with racism themselves. Since the anti-black racism demonstrations began, what was once celebrated can suddenly be indefensible. As Kitty Simpson explains, America's top military official is now distancing himself from a key episode of Donald Trump's response to the protests. Piece by piece, an added layer of protection around the White House was carried away. A symbolic scale down of security at a place the president used to put on a show of force. Peaceful protesters were violently removed from this site nearly two weeks ago, so Donald Trump could hold a photo op. The country's top ranking military officer says he now regrets taking part. I should not have been there. My presence in that moment and in that environment created a perception of the military involved in domestic politics. The general joins a list of military leaders, including two of Trump's former cabinet members, who have criticized the president's handling of the growing unrest. Trump focused elsewhere today, reaffirming his support for police, pledging additional funding and training. We'll make no progress and heal no wounds by falsely labeling tens of millions of decent Americans as racist or bigots. This message will be front and center when the president resumes campaigning next week. President Trump is, the African American community is very near and dear to his heart. Um, at these rallies, he often shares the great work he has done for minority communities. Trump's first rally in months is planned for Tulsa, Oklahoma. 99 years ago, white supremacists there destroyed a black community, killing hundreds of people. The date is June 19th, also known as Juneteenth, a holiday marking the end of slavery in the U.S. Well, we all know the history of Donald Trump, and the date is nothing by accident. I mean, it's a disrespect to the people from the past. I mean, I, I just don't think that maybe it's a slap in the face. With the additional layer of security fencing now gone, demonstrators are once again within shouting distance of the White House. The big question is whether their shouts are being heard. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. So yes, it is Thursday, but at issue is taking the week off. Yeah, instead, Rosie's up next with the first Canadian TV interview with the top infectious diseases expert in the United States. Hear from Dr. Anthony Fauci on the World Health Organization disagreeing with Donald Trump and how to beat the coronavirus.
We're cautiously optimistic that at the end of the year, we could have a vaccine that could be ready to deploy to the public. The full interview right after this. Today marks three months since the World Health Organization declared a global pandemic. And since then, the U.S. has been hit particularly hard with more reported cases and deaths than any other country. CBC's chief political correspondent, Rosemary Barton, spoke to the top infectious diseases expert leading that country's response. Thank you very much, Mr. President, Mr. Vice President. Dr. So Anthony nice Fauci see, has uh, been a public face in the fight against COVID-19 in the U.S., pushing science over politics at the White House and elsewhere. I have never made myself out to be the end-all and only voice in this. He's a key member of President Trump's coronavirus task force and unafraid to contradict him, fueling speculation around his firing. I'm not firing him. I think he's a wonderful guy. In May, Dr. Fauci was possibly exposed to the virus. He quarantined as a precaution and seems to have kept a lower profile ever since. This as the U.S. moves forward with its reopening, despite his earlier warnings to move slowly. I asked Dr. Fauci about that and how the U.S. has handled the crisis. Dr. Fetchy, thank you so much for making the time. Good to be with you. I want to talk a little bit about the reopening uh, process in the United States because over the past week or so, we have seen some increases in cases in places like Texas, California, Oregon. D does that tell you that the reopening is happening too quickly? What are your concerns around that? Whenever you start to reopen uh, or get to some degree of what we call normality, there will be increase in cases. The interesting and important thing is to identify, isolate, and contact trace so that you can blunt those little blips and prevent them from becoming true rebounds of infection. That's what we have to see, because you're right, we are seeing the appearance of additional infections, particularly in the areas that are opening. Mm -hmm. If we handle them well, we could be okay. If not, then we really have a significant problem. The U.S. has had a uh, mortality rate that's about 60% higher than Canada's. It's had twice the number of cases per capita. Why do you think that there has been that vast difference? You know, that's a good question. We don't really know the difference, uh, the reason for that difference. Um, it could possibly be, I mean, there, if you look at what, what dictates morbidity and mortality, we have a particular vulnerability among individuals who do have these comorbidities of hypertension, of obesity, uh, of a, a variety of other underlying conditions. We also have vulnerability among our African-American population. Yes. Yes. It is entirely conceivable that the disparity in the relative proportions demographically of African-Americans and other minorities would make our mortality rate higher. I don't know that as a fact, mm -hmm. but I think that's something we should at least consider. The border between Canada and the U.S., as, as you know, was shut down to non-essential travel uh, towards the end of March. Travelers will no longer be permitted to cross the border for recreation and tourism. We don't want people coming into contact because that's the way we're going to win this war. That is so important. Can I ask you what you think should be the criteria for reopening the border between our two countries? What, what would you like to see in place on both sides in order to make that reopening safe? I am not an expert on closing and opening borders. What you would like to see under any circumstances would be to see a significant diminution consistently in the number of cases, hospitalizations, and obviously deaths. Mm -hmm. But I think what you mentioned about some states now having an increase in the number of cases makes one pause and be a little bit concerned. But I don't want to extrapolate that to making any statements about border closing. That, that's fair. Um, what is the message to, to the world uh, about how the United States is doing or how concerned should the world be given how this unfolded there? Well, I'm not so sure the world should be concerned. The United States has gone through a very, very difficult situation. I mean, you know the numbers yes. of millions of cases, and we have now 112,000 deaths. That is the most of any country. That is something that is obviously very serious that we're trying to deal with. I think that's more of a concern for us 
than it is for a concern for the rest of the world. In Canada, there is a real deference uh, from politicians to public health officials and scientists in the way they are you know, asked to answer a lot of questions around the pandemic. How does that kind of deference help the population trust information? Well, when you hear from health officials whose job is the safety and health of the nation, then you have confidence that what you're hearing is something that is worth following, which is the reason why I'm on television here talking to you, <laughs> that I do the same thing with outlets in the United States to try and get the accurate information to the general public. Has that been challenging for you, given the administration? No, actually not, because I have been able to freely go out and talk about evidence-based facts. Uh, and I've had no, no interference in my doing that. Let me ask you a little bit about the WHO, if you don't mind. Obviously, it's been uh, there have been lots of questions in, in all countries, in this country as well, but the president in, in your country has said that he intends for the U.S. to leave the WHO. Redirecting those funds to other worldwide and deserving urgent global public health needs. Are you worried about the consequences of that decision? Well, I mean, I've been dealing with the WHO now for... Uh, for decades. Uh, the WHO is an imperfect organization. It certainly has made some missteps, but it has also done a lot of good. The world needs a WHO. I would hope that we would continue to benefit from what the WHO can do at the same time that they continue to improve mm -hmm. themselves. But if the U.S. is withdrawing and, and has suspended all funding as the biggest funder, d d are you concerned about the future of the WHO as someone that has leaned on it and, and been found it helpful in the past? No, like I said, and I'll repeat, the world does need a oh. WHO. As imperfect as it is, but we would hope that as it goes forward, it would continue to improve and try to essentially correct some of the missteps of the past. Uh, can, we, can we talk about vaccines a little bit? Because there are more than 100 or so vaccines that are in development now, as, long, as well as various treatments. We have heard maybe by the end of the year. What is your assessment on how close we are to that right now? We will be going into a phase three trial for efficacy, which is a large trial of about 30,000 individuals, which if we're successful, and I have to underline if, because whenever you're dealing with the development of a vaccine, Nothing is ever guaranteed, mm -hmm. but we're cautiously optimistic that at the end of the year, the beginning of 2021, we could have a vaccine that could be ready to deploy to the public. At this stage, do, do you think a second wave is inevitable? We know the most pandemics do have one, but is it inevitable? Will we be able to contain it? I don't think it's inevitable. I think we will, as we get into the fall and winter, see additional cases. If we handle them properly and efficiently, I believe it is not inevitable hmm. that we will have a second wave, as it were. But it could happen if we don't handle the cases that will inevitably appear. What is not inevitable is that it will turn into a second wave. It, you do sound more hopeful than I would have expected, though. Well, I'm cautiously optimistic about the interventions that we're gonna be able to implement. I believe that if we get a vaccine and we implement the public health measures to the best of our ability, that we'll get over this. This is a terrible ordeal we're going through, but it will end and we will get over it. Dr. Fauci, thank you so much for making the time for this country. We do appreciate it, sir. My pleasure, it's good to be with you. Thank you for having me. And next on The National, the black Canadian hockey player who was the focus of solidarity marches in the 1970s. These things have been going on for a very, very long time. The only thing that's changed is the fact that we're, we're recording them. The tragedy that overtook Paul Smithers' life after a lifetime of racism. His story and what he thinks of this moment in history. Next. As protests here and in the U.S. force a wider confrontation with the reality of racism, for Paul Smithers, it's also forced a fresh confrontation with his past.
In the 1970s, Smithers made international headlines as an Ontario teen, an extraordinary sight on the ice, not just because of his raw talent, but because he was black and because of one defining incident. After a game, Smithers confronted a player who had attacked him with racial slurs. They scuffled, and that player died. Smithers fought his conviction for manslaughter all the way to the Supreme Court and lost. Racism and the chain of actions and consequences that flow from it marked his life forever. But tonight, he is opening up to the national. I think I started to like hockey at probably about the age of about five. It was like walking or like breathing and it was an escape. My mom would be waking me up at about five o'clock in the morning to get dressed in my hockey gear in order to go to the rink. Going back to that period of time, I was the only black young man playing hockey. It started to be with the N-word. And my father always told me that um, if you're just one of the guys, uh, they don't bother you. But if you start to be maybe a little better than some of the guys, that's when they notice you and that's when they'll throw that kind of stuff at you. The night that everything happened at February 18th, 1973, there was a rivalry between Barry and I, which were, we were two of the better players on the team. It's just when the N-word starts to surface and it becomes more and more predominant throughout the game. The N-word is incredibly embarrassing. It's humiliating. You feel like you want to crawl under a table because how do you respond to that? At that point, I went to the dressing room and I had had enough. I decided to myself that this evening, something has to change. I remember saying, either you're going to apologize to me or I'm going to kick the you know what out of you. And his response was, ha, me apologize to you. And I think I may have tried to throw a punch at him. I remember him coming toward me at which point I kicked out at him. I just remember him, him falling to the, to the ground and me being in disbelief of what had, what had happened. Nevertheless, I'm responsible for it. Whether it be that he was anticipating the kick and it made him vomit, uh, which he choked on, which he choked on his vomit, uh, or it was that the kick landed, but there was never a mark on his body. Uh, that day, my life changed. I, uh, I was no longer a kid. Uh, my naive day was gone. I really didn't have any idea of the magnitude or gravity of the situation. There were a number of different protests that took place. I was a 16-year-old kid. I didn't know what to make of it, except for the fact that I knew someone was fighting for me. What's going on in the U.S. right now is somewhat bittersweet. You know, these things have been going on for a very, very long time. The only thing that's changed is the fact that we're, we're recording them. Maybe we've seen enough. And I absolutely believe this is that moment in time for change. We are no different than the United States when it comes to racism, we're not. But the underlying current here in Canada of racism is far more dangerous because you just don't see it coming. I believe that racism begins in the home. And I think we need to be really mindful of our words, our choice of words, because words matter. I am just a segue into this is what it looked like then, this is what it looks like today, and it really isn't any different. But we have a chance for change. That's it. Worth listening to and thinking about again and again. When we come back, after months off the set, the Canadian film and TV industry is getting back to work. From the cameras to the masks, we're going to show you what the new normal looks like. Well, in several provinces, the film and TV industry is starting back up again. Accommodations have been made to keep people safe. But as Eli Glasner explains, some productions still face one major hurdle that only Ottawa can help them clear. 
Two hours north of Winnipeg, Dr. Carrie Prairie Vet is one of the first shows to resume filming. But in this new normal, it's lights, camera, caution. Everything is cleaned and uh, sanitizers and masks are made available to every single person who comes in contact with us. You know, so we're, we're making an effort to bear the burden of those additional costs. The producer of CBC's Burden of Truth says COVID is even changing what writers write. We've asked them to do their best to write us things that can be accomplished within the new protocols and guidelines without affecting the creative too much. So all of these walls can already shoot up into the ceiling on these motors. In Vancouver, where many American shows are shot, the border is open for people with valid work permits, although they still have to quarantine for 14 days. So these are all patient rooms here. As the good doctor gets ready to resume shooting soon, producer Sean Williamson says they're making more space and using remote cameras to keep crews safe. We very often would cram 25 people into a small room like this. Now we'll cram three people in. With a plan and relatively few COVID cases, Vancouver is in demand. But they're still struggling with how to film intimate scenes safely. If you sanitize your hands and the other actor sanitizes their hands, you can hold hands because effectively your hands are now clean and clear of the virus. But kissing is a different thing. But for productions that didn't have a contract before the COVID shutdown, there's a major problem. Insurance. 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 Insurance companies are refusing to cover any future pandemic-related claims. The Canadian Media Producers Association has proposed the federal government underwrite a new fund producers would pay into. We have to sort it. There is absolutely no choice. A huge chunk of production won't happen without it. With the Producers Association estimating billions of dollars of work could be lost, it says Ottawa needs to move fast or those cameras will roll elsewhere. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. Now, for all the things this pandemic has changed about our daily lives, we've often gotten questions about one place in particular. As people get out of their homes and increasingly into public spaces, public bathrooms will get busier as well. So, a question you might have. What are the chances of getting sick inside of one? Right, well, there's the obvious risk of the doorknob and the tap handles and all the high-touch surfaces. So standard rules apply, touch as few things as possible. But is the toilet potentially stirring up and spreading the virus? There has been virus uh, found in feces. It's usually a fragment virus and it's unclear if it's infected and it might just be because people are swallowing saliva or mucus and then it's, it's found in the feces for that reason. So maybe the virus in the toilet isn't viable to begin with and even if you flush and stir it up, you aren't really inhaling it. You're smelling it, sure, but that's different. This virus doesn't travel via smell. Those particles are much too small. So go ahead and close the lid if you want, but the bottom line... We've not seen any epidemiologic suggestion that it's spread through feces. After the break, a reunion three months in the making. <laughs> As Newfoundland and Labrador eases some of its COVID-19 restrictions, more scenes like this in tonight's moment. As things start to reopen in parts of the country after months of lockdown, some families are getting a rare chance to reunite. In Newfoundland, residents of Alderwood Estates Retirement Centre were able to see and hug one family member for the first time in months. And that magic moment is our moment. I haven't seen my mom since, um, <clears throat> here we go. <laughs> uh, oh my gosh, last time I saw my mom was probably a week or two just before the COVID started. As you can tell, I'm overly excited and nervous and it'll be great. See you, I wanted them to get on camera, that moment of, look at you all pretty in yellow. Okay, so, I, so I'm gonna bring Betty to the door. This is so much better than winning the lotto. Even though I've never won the lotto, but... 
good hug. Mm. You know, I, I have friends with family in nursing homes, and they describe this as being torturous. This, this whole process has been horrible, and they're really worried about the mental health of, of people and becoming a physical health problem. So something like that is, is fantastic. Yeah, and you know, in the meantime, we've, we've had things like, like video conferencing to kind of tide us over, but it doesn't, doesn't even begin to hold a candle to, to physical touch, that, that simple hug. Uh, that's The National for this Thursday, June 11th. Have a good night.